For us to try, uh, there's a lot I want to cover uh, with you tonight, but I just want to begin with that point uh, because this issue that's being discussed widely now, the legitimacy of the Supreme Court, seems to have uh, never been more ripe, uh, certainly in my lifetime. Uh, you have uh, the wife of a Supreme Court justice in communications with the White House that have been subpoenaed. These are subpoenaed communications. Uh, and Clarence Thomas has ruled on subpoenas involving the person that those communications were with. He has ruled in a case that might include communications uh, of, of his wife. Uh, and there's not one word, not one word from him, not one word from anyone at the Supreme Court about uh, Clarence Thomas's future participation in those cases, raising a giant legitimacy issue uh, for an individual justice as big as I've ever seen. And then you get to this minority rule outcome of, Ro of overturning Roe versus Wade uh, that questions uh, what this court's relationship is to the very country uh, the, where it is supposed to be interpreting justice. Is, is this state of illegitimacy or whatever it is we're going to call it that the Supreme Court has found itself in now is this a new place for this court? Is this something you've seen before? I'm afraid that your question answers itself. But that, too, is a no-brainer. We've never seen it before. We have justices like Barrett who were put on the court during a presidential election by a party that said that when it's a year away from a presidential election, we can't possibly give somebody like Merrick Garland a hearing. We have justices like Kavanaugh, who are not really seriously investigated by the FBI after Christine Blasey Ford testifies. We have justices who, as you pointed out in the earlier part of the program, uh, represent a very small part of the nation, taking away rights for the first time in our history from half the people in this country, and not just half, because men's rights, too, are on the chopping block. You know, the legitimacy of this court is just clearly uh, clearly in question. And I want to get to this point uh, in the Alito draft, uh, where he, the whole thing in many, seems to hinge on the, his notion that uh, privacy rights or and the derivative abortion rights from that are not uh, deeply rooted, as it says, uh, not deeply rooted in the nation's history and traditions. And as you know, that phrase appears in quotation marks in the draft because he is quoting uh, a 1999 Supreme Court opinion. And the 1999 opinion is actually quoting, uh, uh, paraphrasing slightly, uh, Justice Cardozo, a couple of things Justice Cardozo said in the 1930s. And so the phrasing itself isn't deeply rooted uh, in the Supreme Court itself. If, if not deeply rooted is, you know, roughly 50 years, th this court doesn't seem to think that's deeply rooted. Well, the language can mean whatever you want it to mean. Yeah. But in this case, he really means that, that a history that didn't include women in the first place has to keep them in second place. It has to subordinate them. The language is from a decision that the Supreme Court essentially overruled in Obergefell when it said that even though same-sex marriage was not part of our early history, it's what freedom and equality and dignity have come to mean. We now have a court that is turning the clock back rapidly. And the question of whether a court, so many of whose members are put there by presidents who lost a majority of the American people can impose this regressive, almost Neanderthal minority view on all of us is a really serious question. The, the legitimacy of that court is much more at stake than simply because Clarence Thomas won't recuse himself. The, uh, the case against Donald Trump uh, is going to be presented by the January 6th committee uh, within a matter of weeks at this point, and his uh, what he, what role he played in the insurrection at the Capitol. Based on the public evidence that we know now from Georgia to Washington, what is your assessment of Donald Trump's criminal liability in, in this body of evidence? 
I think the evidence quite clearly establishes, even if you give him the presumption of innocence and require proof of state of mind, quite clearly proves that he is guilty of various forms of criminal conspiracy, attempted overthrow of the government, unsuccessful but nonetheless violent insurrection, um, also violations of the laws of Georgia, the election laws where Fannie Willis, the district attorney of Fulton County, has convened a special grand jury. She's waiting until after the May 24th primary in Georgia before hearing more witnesses, but the evidence is piling up. And when people say, as the attorney general, the former attorney general, Eric Holder, did on your air last night, that yes, he's committed indictable crimes in all likelihood, but it would be divisive uh, to indict him. With all respect, I think that divisiveness is a given in our current situation. It would encourage him to do it again, not to indict him. We have a situation in which it's not simply a matter of sort of getting even, but a matter of deterring the destruction of democracy. We have to look at 2024 and not just 2020. So to answer your question, I think the evidence of criminality is clear. I'm hoping that accountability will follow, either through the district attorney in Georgia or through the attorney general of the United States or both. And I think when the January 6 committee's conclusions are laid out in living color and in great detail during the public hearings in June, the nation will come to see something that I'm afraid a lot of people have just forgotten because there's so much news. I mean, so much is going on, it's easy to forget that we have a former president who really didn't accept his defeat and wants to seize power again. That's dangerous for the country.